All right, let's get started for the second session. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce David Perry. He's a compute integration specialist at the University of Melbourne. He's working to increase research productivity using cloud and high performance computing. And today he's going to talk about running Python on a supercomputer. David, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I've only tried this talk on my 18-month-old son so far, and he had a bit of an accident halfway through, and I had to go and change him. So I hope you have a better reaction. <laughs> so Python on a supercomputer. So you've written a simulation. Uh, you're analyzing some data, and this doesn't take one second, five seconds, you know, a few minutes to run. It takes hours to finish. And someone, uh, you go and test your code. It doesn't work perfectly the first time and you have to go in through this all over again, hours, days, however long you take code takes to run. Then your boss comes along and says, hey, I know this is really painful, but can you come along and just add this extra little thing? And you realize the sun is gonna burn out before you ever get this thing finished. What do you do? I say, use a supercomputer. Your time is valuable. Uh, computers are cheap relative to your time. Let's throw more computing power at it. So you might be thinking supercomputers are a bit archaic and a bit overkill for what it is you need to do. Surely they're for high energy physics and predicting the weather and all that kind of thing. Uh, what I wanna try and get across today is that anyone, and especially everyone here who can use at least a little bit of Python, is capable of using a supercomputer and being more productive. This is a modern supercomputer, you know, even though it's in a really old place. It's actually at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in a lovely glass case in the middle of an old church. So there's only a few things you need to know to get started with using a supercomputer. Um, people spend their entire lives optimizing things, but to get started, you really don't need to know a whole lot. So the first thing that you need to understand is the architecture of how a supercomputer works. We can't build one really fast computer. They work by tying a whole bunch of computers together. Each individual core within uh, each node of the supercomputer isn't any faster than your laptop. In fact, for efficiency reasons, it might be a little bit slower but you might have each node having eight, 12, 15, 20 cores, and you might have dozens or hundreds of these nodes tied together. The biggest supercomputers in the world have millions of cores all tied together. What allows you to do that is a really fast networking that joins them together so that they can act as a whole. And this is the, the exotic part. You then have uh, high-speed storage, which is shared among all those nodes, and you have management nodes that actually coordinate the work between those. So you submit the job to the supercomputer, the management node works out where it's gonna run and distribute it, distributes the work to the different resources that are available to you. And these are usually shared systems, which means everyone else is hitting it at the same time and the, the job is to, to distribute that around the supercomputer. Which brings me to the next thing. The scheduler is the bit of software that runs on the management node. Its job is to take those requests from different users and distribute them among all the resources that are available. So I might say, I want 10 cores, 100 cores, and I want them for six hours. Someone else says, well, I want one core, but I want it for three weeks, something like that. The scheduler's job is a little bit like a telephone exchange. It takes those requests and routes them. Slurm is the most popular, or well, one of the most popular um, kind of varieties of scheduler. It's an open source product, but you will see others around like PBS and Sun Grid Engine and so forth but they all work in a similar kind of way. So it's the architecture, that's broadly what a scheduler is. The next thing you need to understand is the different job types that you typically run on a supercomputer and the, the, par the, uh, the programming patterns, I suppose, that go along with those. So the first one is what we call embarrassingly parallel or pleasingly parallel or something like that. This is where each individual job within um, the overall super job, I suppose, uh, is completely independent. So say you're batch processing 100,000 images and it doesn't matter what each image is relative to the other ones. You can just go and kick off a bunch of independent jobs. They don't look at the other jobs and their scales as well as you can possibly hope for. So you can do that in Python straight away and really there's not a lot to it. You just have some constructs that supply the input files or the parameters that you wanna do and off it'll run and you can use your 100 cores or your 1,000 cores or whatever it might be. So I won't talk too much more about that because it's, it's relatively straightforward. The next one is uh, where we're using a single node within the supercomputer, but we're using multiple cores and we're spreading our work across those cores. So this is the same as if you were to do multi-threaded or multi-process programming uh, on your own computer with say two or four cores. The only advantage being on a supercomputer that you might have say eight or 12 or, or maybe more cores than that, if it's a little bit more exotic. But all of the tools that you can use for multi-process and multi-threaded programming in Python you can also use on a supercomputer as well. 
And the last one is multi-core and multi-node jobs. And this is where we're using those cores within a single node, but we're getting a whole bunch of nodes to work together in concert to solve the one problem, and they're communicating tightly and, and working as a whole. This is what we think of as uh, traditional high-performance computing or supercomputing. What you would normally have in a situation like this where you're modeling a rocket engine is each computer would be responsible for simulating a particular volume of space. So say my first computer is responsible for this space, next one's responsible for that space and so on. They communicate with each other the boundary conditions and each individual node calculates its own little area of space. So in this case, it's doing all the physics, it's doing all the chemical reactions that are occurring within that volume. And this is basically the only way to do these really large simulations like computational fluid dynamics, that sort of thing, where it was never even possible to do it on a single computer in the first place in a realistic way. You had to break the problem out across a grid. So that's multi-node, multi-core programming. So you'll see these two terms a lot if you ever delve into supercomputer programming, uh, MP or OpenMP and OpenMPI, which are the, I guess, the most common and, and open implementations. OpenMP is about multi-threaded programming, basically. It's uh, a framework that's available for C and Fortran, not really touched so much in Python, but allows you to do things like unwrap loops and distribute those loops across different machines and different cores. The important thing is that it's communicating via shared memory. So we have you know, our RAM, we're passing messages within that RAM, it's not actually leaving the node. Um, so that's available if you were to write in another language other than Python, but we have plenty of tools already for doing multi-threaded um, and multi-process programming. MPI is a little bit more interesting. This is probably the, you know, the, the real archetypal uh, HPC programming framework, and it's about sending messages. So the messages might be within the single node, or it might be across nodes, in which case you're transmitting them across a network. And there are many different uh, kind of approaches for that. It could be kind of a, um, a MapReduce operation, or it could be something like that uh, rocket engine I showed you before, where you're just communicating the boundary conditions. So the whole model uh, is cohesive. So you'll see these two terms a lot, but we don't have to deal with these too much. When you are dealing with supercomputers, you'll see C and Fortran, and this is the, if you're a very serious scientist, you must use these things. And um, I make fun of Fortran, but that's a pretty cool book cover. I wouldn't mind that. Um, but you will see, you know, 50-year-old Fortran, that kind of thing, and, and kind of some skepticism. But we love Python. I'm very glad to be here at PyCon. Uh, we shouldn't feel ashamed about using Python because we can get very good performance out of it, and we can make it run on a supercomputer very successfully. In fact, I think, at least in the case of the University of Melbourne, Python and R, and, and dare I say MATLAB jobs, would outnumber those that are getting written, you know, in Fortran. Um, why would you ever write Fortran unless your supervisor is unloaded on you and you have no choice? So let's do everything with Python. So before we go and do things in parallel across a supercomputer and get a bit fancy, it's worth doing the easy wins, I suppose, actually optimizing your code. Um, I said, you know, your time is valuable, but there's, there's easy wins to be had. And I won't go into these things in too much detail, because if you go and look at PyCon, you know, parallel programming, there's a fantastic back catalog of things that go over all these tools. So things like NumPy, PyPy, Number, Cython, things that can take pure Python and make them go faster by uh, compiling them or dropping down to, to optimize C libraries, that kind of stuff. So if you can go and do something like line profiling, find out where the bottlenecks are in your code and take some easy wins, by all means go and do that before we go and move on to some, uh, some parallel programming, which is what I'll go into next. So the example that I'm going to keep looping back to in this is uh, calculating pi using a Monte Carlo technique. And all that means in this case is that we have a dartboard, throwing a bunch of darts, and we're counting how many land within the blue region within a unit circle of the middle. We take that as a proportion of the total, multiply it by four, and we get an estimate of pi. The important thing is the more darts you throw, the more samples you take, the more accurate the estimate of pi will be. So this is the dumb way of calculating pi, but this is just a simple example that we're going to keep looping back to. So this is the naive Python example. Um, I'll try my fancy pointer. So we're doing 50 million points, and this is the business end here. We're just looping through, generating two random numbers, and working out if it's within the unit circle or not. And then that's our estimate of pi. So this is a serial code. It's pure Python. How do we do with that? Um, oh, and just by way of background, uh, I talked about Slurm before the job scheduler. In order to submit this Python job to the supercomputer, you wrap it in a script like this. This is basically a bash script, but it has some particular syntax up the top here. These sbatch commands, which bash would normally ignore, but Slurm, the scheduler, 
takes those as instructions of what resources to allocate to your job. So we've asked to do one task here. We want one CPU. You can do that if you want, just because it's a supercomputer. doesn't mean you can't have one CPU. And we want it for an hour. And this is what's called the wall time. You, it's a contract you have with a supercomputer. If you don't finish in that hour, it'll cut you off because it's promised a supercomputer to someone else who's booked in after you. But you can usually be pretty generous and allow more time when you're just prototyping. So we pull Python into the environment and kick off this Python script as we normally would at the command line. Uh, it might start straight away, or it might have to wait in the queue, and, and off it'll go. So I did this for a few different job sizes. And what I'm plotting here is, um, on the x-axis, the problem size. So as we do more and more iterations, millions of iterations. And on the y-axis, we have uh, the time for each million iterations. Notice that both of them are log scale, so we're actually covering a lot of area here. So the important thing is, this is taking about half a second per million iterations, per million points on that dartboard that we're calculating. So this is our, our baseline. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, do those easy wins, do the optimization. And I'm going to be super lazy. You could do this with Scython. You could do this um, with PyPy, something like that. But I've decided to use number. The only change I've made is to go and import number and go JIT. And that's it. Everything else is the same. What number will now do is go and run that uh, code or watch it as it runs infer the types and compile it on the fly for you. And you'll no longer have to you know, dynamically check the types every time, and you'll get the speed ups associated with that. Again, it's just one line. And I get a 30 times speed up with that. So for a lazy, lazy, lazy approach, which I like, it's a, it's a pretty good way to do. And I emphasize there are many ways you go about making this optimal. So that's the starting point, but we're still on a single uh, CPU. Uh, let's actually do the supercomputer thing and throw more resources at this. Uh, notice as well, we don't actually get the full speed up until we move down here a little bit. So as the problem size gets bigger, we're overcoming the initial kind of setup costs um, that are associated with you know, doing that just-in-time compilation. So what I'm going to do first is, again, this isn't strictly supercomputing um, in of itself, but we're going to use a single node within the supercomputer, and the one I'm using has eight CPUs. So that may or may not be better than your laptop, depending on how good your laptop is. Uh, and you could do multiple threads. You could do high-level um, packages that take care of all that stuff for you. But I'm just going to use the multiprocessing library. And all I'm doing in this case, the actual Monte Carlo function stays the same. But over here, I'm creating a pool of eight processes. And I'm going to run that function eight times and collate the result into a, uh, a Python array. So eight processes running at the same time on these eight different cores. And again, you could do this with threads, but I like processes in Python. So we get a six times speed up, uh, at least when we get to a big enough problem size. So we don't quite get the eight times speed up, uh, because there is always a serial component, unless you're doing embarrassingly parallel work. And that constrains things. But again, you know, we've only still added another couple of extra lines of code to split this up into eight different jobs at once. And we've gotten another six times speed up. So let's go even further. Um, the supercomputer that I have access to is fairly small by international standards, but it still has a couple of thousand cores. So I went and took 100 of them. And the way I did that is with uh, MPI, OpenMPI, which is the package I mentioned before, which you'll recall is about passing messages around. So the workers now, I'm going to have 100 workers going at once. They're going to be communicating um, either within a single node uh, via shared memory or across a network if they're across different nodes. And because I've got more than eight, they're going to have to be spread across different computers to make this work. This will run 100 times. And the important thing is that in the very first couple of lines there, the program ascertains where it is in the world. So we work out that there are 100 workers and work out if I'm you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, blah, blah, blah. If I am 0, I kick off the master function and anything else I'm the slave. So with the master function, all it's doing is sending a message out to all of the slaves saying, this is how many points I want you to calculate pi to, or number of simulated um, you know, darts that we're throwing at the board. It calculates that in slave. Um, it waits for a message to be received, does that calculation, and then sends it back again. And then notice in the master side, it waits till all the workers receive, um, you know, report back their result. And we collate that. And let's see how we go with that. So we only get a one and a half times speed up. That's like kind of sucks. In fact, it's actually worse at small problem sizes because there's all that setup of initializing the network and passing messages around. 
this kind of illustrates, I guess, um, what's called Amdo's law, where the serial component of the parallel processing job you're doing um, constrains the overall speed up you get, which is another way of saying um, just because you throw 100 cores at something doesn't mean it's going to go 100 times faster. There is a hard limit there and diminishing returns as you push things on. Uh, I'm sure I could do more in this particular example to get more value out of those 100 cores, but um, this kind of demonstrates the point. I've thrown you know, almost 10 or over 10 times more resources at it and only gotten a, a marginal kind of speed up. But that gives you a taste of MPI at least, and that has um, many more complex constructs than I've shown, including um, broadcasting messages and scatter and gather and all that kind of stuff that, uh, that are much more sophisticated than the example I gave here. So that's uh, MP, uh, MPI, sorry. Uh, we've done multiple process, we've done number just to get the quick speed up. So remember I said these were the three types of jobs that you tend to run on a supercomputer. Well, there is another. Supercomputers aren't getting any faster. Uh, sorry, um, Moore's law means that we can't put more uh, clock speed into a computer. Um, we can't you know, make the features any smaller than they already are, but we are stuffing more transistors into computers. And the question is, where are they going? And the answer is into GPUs. Uh, modern supercomputers, as in those built in the last few years, derive a significant portion of their performance with acceleration via GPUs. Um, there's other products as well, but by and large, it's GPUs getting stuffed in. And the reason for that, well, there's a couple of reasons. One is it's impossible to get um, the energy efficiency to a satisfactory level without doing things with GPUs. They're just much more energy efficient than individual CPUs. And there are just certain jobs that are really well suited to them. So dense um, matrix algebra works really well on GPUs. So you'll see a lot of these being pushed into supercomputers now, and you can run your code on CPUs and GPUs and, and a combination of the two. So um, for those who aren't familiar, and I'm uh, nominally I'm an electrical engineer, but I still don't know the architecture of GPUs super well. But the idea is we have thousands of cores available to us rather than say two, four, eight that might be on a conventional CPU. Those cores are simplified um, and they're communicating over shared memory, but nonetheless, there's a lot of them that we can do work with. This is the reason why deep learning is such a thing. Um, it's only been, I can't remember when the paper came out, sort of five years ago, when someone worked out you could run a neural network on a GPU and problems that were previously intractable were now quite tractable, um, thanks to GPUs. And so everyone's rushing to, to port their code across where they can. So let's do GPUs to solve this problem, which seems overkill, but hey, we can do it. So again, um, I've made three changes to this. Uh, again, four lines of code all up. So again, we're sticking to Python pretty closely. You could actually do this in proper CUDA, like write C CUDA and, and do all that. Um, but again, I'm using number, and number will try and convert um, this code into CUDA for you, which is pretty fantastic. So again, instead of just JIT, I've done CUDA.JIT. The other change I've made is this is going to run, um, I can't remember how many versions I did. I think I did this a million times or something like this. So this will go from zero to a million or zero to a thousand for memory. So this code will run on each core within the GPU and this ascertains which core it's running on or which thread. I've had to change the uh, random number generation um, just because it has to be something that can be converted to CUDA and I didn't like the native Python. And the other major change is that instead of returning the output value, I'm writing that to a shared bit of memory, and that's how we're going to collate everything at the end. So again, I haven't made a huge number of changes to take advantage of this GPU and could go into a lot more depth of doing this than I have. But let's give that a try. So just with that, we've gotten a four times speed up on top of the, the 100 um, CPU. So I'm still using one CPU plus one GPU, and I'm now fastest out of all um, by quite a margin. So all up, we've gone to 1,000 times, and we've talked about adding you know, half a dozen lines of code to get that speed up. So you might be thinking, oh, I'll throw away the supercomputer. I'll just get my gaming GPU, thanks. Um, this is just with one GPU. Um, the GPUs that we have at the University of Melbourne on our cluster at the moment, there's four of them per node. So potentially you could go to 4,000. Um, they're actually kind of old compared to the latest generation. So they're probably about two or four times slower than the latest generation that NVIDIA have released. So say that's 16,000. And we're just about to build a cluster that has, I think, 100 GPUs rather than four or eight. So again, another factor of 10 on top of that. Plus, you could throw all the CPUs at it as well. So we're getting pretty significant speed ups. So uh, I've tried to go through the architecture of supercomputers, the kind of typical programming patterns in a fairly high level way. Um, the next couple of things I want to go over are about the implementation details and what it's actually like to work in these environments and 
the sort of barriers that you deal with. The first one is that these are shared systems. Um, it's a little bit like a kindergarten. All the sharp things have been put away. The doors are locked. You can't hurt yourself. You don't have root access is what I'm trying to get across. That's good. Um, well, the sysadmins are happy at least, but it means if you have binary dependencies, if you have unusual things you want to install, you can't necessarily do it. So if you have something you want to install and you don't have root access, what do you do? The first thing, whoops, ah, and we want to escape. We want to run uh, binary dependencies. We want to have an unusual Python version that isn't otherwise there, and so on. So you know the pacifiers are your lovely binary illicit code in this situation. So the first option is be nice to your sysadmin, which is good advice anyway. Ask them nicely to install exactly what you want. Um, but perhaps you have really complex dependencies. You have a pipeline that has a dozen bits of code, and um, they're just going to take some time to get to this, and you might throw it all away anyway. The other option is to use pip and conda, and they both have options to install your libraries into user space. Um, and conda can install binary dependencies, including for number and, and, um, and scipy and so forth, into your user space, so you don't have to touch the system directories. So that's all good. And the last one is using a container. So you can't use Docker on supercomputers typically uh, because the, the Docker daemon itself needs to run as root and they frown upon that. Uh, Singularity, if you Google that, Singularity HPC is a container engine just for uh, HPC and scientific computing. It's kind of a stripped down version of Docker that doesn't need to run as root um, and is gaining a lot of popularity. So you can have everything in this, including your base OS and all the dependencies. So the very last thing, who here is actually from academia or some government research body that would have access to a supercomputer? So that leaves a few of you poor people who don't have access to a supercomputer. And so you might be scowling at me right now thinking, what does this have to do with me? Um, you can go and build your own on eBay and buy stuff and bolt it all together. Could go well or not, as the case may be. Um, but you can also build one in the cloud, in which case if you do that, you now have complete control over it. So there are lots of ways to do this, including doing it all from scratch. Um, but the way I suggest is using a package called Alsys Flight. There's kind of a freemium-based framework for spinning up supercomputers in commercial and public clouds. And um, what I'm going to give an example on is AWS. So uh, if you go and find Alsys Flight in the AWS marketplace, select the, uh, the personal HBC cluster option here, which will spin up a bunch of nodes and a, and a login node for you to play with. Put it in the region you want. Give them your credit card number, I'm sorry to say, but we'll deal with that in the moment. And off you go. Um, there's a few options you have to do. Here we mainly want to set the SSH key that we use to log into the system. And we select the size nodes that we want to deal with. So whether you want a lot of RAM or a little red RAM or how many CPUs, all that kind of stuff. And importantly, we use the spot pricing um, in Amazon. So uh, hopefully some of you have heard of that before, the spot pricing in Amazon, where they auction off their spare capacity and typically it's 10% of the price of the on-demand instances. So that means about one or two cents per core hour. So you could run a 100 core supercomputer for a buck an hour kind of thing. So this is quite accessible. Really, you've got no excuse for having a slow computer where you can get things on tap like that. So we kick this off. Um, there's also a scaling policy. So you can start off with one node and expand it as the job size increases and then shut it back down when you're not using it. So you do all that, it takes about 15 minutes. You end up in a login prompt like this, so you SSH in, which is the, the bit up the top there. And we have our environment that we can start doing things with, including Python. Uh, and we get a prompt, and we can start writing jobs and submitting things. So um, that's all I have. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dave. And please take this token of appreciation of the organizers. Uh, do we have any questions? So I'm just going to ask you about the problem I have, which is small jobs. Um, so Python has a certain amount of startup time, and a lot of things might be strung together with a like, hypothetically, lots and lots of bash scripts, which generally run pretty quick. Um, have you ever come across how to get Python going a bit quicker if you're going to try to move away from something like that? So there's more the scripting side of things than the actual calculation side of things? Yeah, I mean, one way uh, you sometimes see this construct of pilot jobs where um, you'll start a Python session or a, a job on the supercomputer and then it waits for instructions to be pushed into it. So in that sort of situation, you could go and start the Python interpreter, interpreter have it you know, already load in everything you need, and then it sits there and waits for to be told what to do uh, to try and override that. And you do see a little bit of that. 
Any more questions? Um, I noticed in your GPU implementation that um, I don't think you did any thread block management for your CUDA code, mm -hmm. so assigning threads per block and blocks per grid. Uh, do you know if you actually went ahead and did that, whether that will help to overcome the serialization problem that happens with um, the small problem set? Because that wasn't overcome when you had the four times speed up that only happened when your problem size grew to a large enough size. Yeah, I did tweak it a bit. Um, not in any sensible way, more empirically of, you know, going between different block sizes and that sort of thing. Um, but this is such a, like, dumb implementation anyway. It should have intermediate calculation of the, the results and so forth to actually make it fast. But, yeah, that's something you would normally do. You would go and, you know, tweak the block sizes and the thread sizes and um, be more selective about the memory that you're writing to as well rather than using the, the global GPU memory, which is what I was doing in that example. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, just interested in the LSES in the cloud sort of spin up thing more as a sort of um, scratch pad for people who do have access to a supercomputer but can sort of maybe start start there. Is uh, Do you tend to have sort of similar file systems and, and characteristics or is it going to sort of perform quite different if you sort of develop there but move to the real thing? Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll give you an NFS mount, the same as you would have similar on other supercomputers. Um, at the really high end, there'll be quite specialised parallel file systems and really expensive InfiniBand networking. Um, most clouds aren't there yet. They're kind of doing 10 or 20 or 40 megabit, mega, uh, gigabit, sorry, Ethernet. Um, but the stuff that you see in supercomputers is, is a kind of another order of magnitude better than that. So if you're doing work where it doesn't depend on that really, really high networking, which the users I support is hardly any at all actually need that, then it's perfectly fine to do it all in the cloud. Um, the other limitation is you have absolutely enormous data sets. Um, so things like genomics or something like that where you have many terabytes of files to stage over into a data center in Sydney in the best case, then that's not so good either. But it can be done and, you know, they'll ship you their little box or, um, you know, ship a container full of data if you really want to and they'll move it back. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you talked about uh, ball time earlier on and the contract with a supercomputer. Do you have any uh, tips for estimating that wall time ahead of time? So if you're starting with your unoptimised Python code, how would you estimate how much wall time you're going to actually need? Uh, if you can run part of the program on your own computer, um, if that's, that's even possible, then that'll give you a good guidance. In fact, um, you know, it'll run a bit slower because they tend to lower the clock speeds a, get a bit for energy efficiency, but that's a good start. Um, and the fact is that usually it's easy to get access to a supercomputer for small jobs, um, at least on the case of ours. Um, it's only when you start asking for it for three or six months at a time, then it'll make you wait. So probably 90% of the time, if you ask for a supercomputer, just one node or half a node for a day of tinkering around, you usually get it straight away. Um, but mileage may vary depending on which facility you're working with. Yep. How nice you are to the sysadmins. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Buy them coffee, wine, lunch, that sort of thing. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, my knowledge of this sort of stuff isn't that all that good, but um, I've been following, and I'm sure the other people in the room have been following this uh, cryptocurrency thing over the last six months. Um, I've been noticing a lot of scientific applications apparently popping up. I'm just wondering <laughs> if uh, if they're viewed as legitimate um, for actually using them as like high performance computing and spread across distributed computing basically. And like if they're viewed as serious. So are you asking if people are Bitcoining on our supercomputer? Or no, no not, not so much Bitcoin, but I've noticed that there's been some, um, some networks and, and all that sort of jazz. Uh, my terminology isn't great, but um, yeah, I've noticed this, a lot of it has been popping up and people are pitching towards a scientific and research basis and I'm just wondering if it's being viewed seriously by the people that's aimed at. I, um, at least in, in my institution, I'm not aware of anyone doing that work, but it certainly does happen on these facilities. Um, and again, it's another GPU intensive kind of process. Um, but I know a lot of that work is now done on ASICs or for the custom case field programmable gate arrays where you need custom silicon to make it fast enough. So I've certainly have heard of it being done on GPUs, but at least in the case of Bitcoin mining and I imagine some of the other 
uh, more intensive ones, they have to roll their own silicon to make it work. But at least for prototyping, I'm, I'm sure it happens. I have a friend who named his jobs Bitcoin miner as a joke on the supercomputer, uh, but the admins did not share the joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, grumpy cat there, you know. <laughs> uh, anyone? Otherwise, that. All right, last one. Hey, um, is the process for optimization really just trial and error? Like, run it, see if it goes faster? Oh, it depends if you're a very serious software engineer or you're me. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, there's, I mean, my, my role at the university is to deal with researchers who are in a hurry and who are not software engineers. And you could come at this from um, a very formal point of view and try and optimize things in a very rigorous, detailed way. Um, but the vast majority of people I deal with are like good enough to get this paper out the door. And so if they can do things in a half assed way but still get a result in twice the time and we can give them the CPU to do that, I'm quite happy to support that. Um, when they start running on the peak facilities in, in Canberra and, and racking up millions of CPU hours, um, that's when people start to sit down and actually be more rigorous around profiling and the kind of tools that they use and working out you know, if they're going to drop down to lower languages and change their structures and so on. And, um, just to follow on, you kind of get a feel for um, like GPU versus CPU for each of your supercomputers? Uh, well, in terms of what, I suppose, it's... <laughs> Uh, like, um, you know, you have a supercomputer and you know, well, just know that a job will be better used with um, splitting it over CPU versus the GPU cores? Um, again, I, I'm not an expert in GPU programming. I guess one constraint is uh, it has to be something that uh, will compile to CUDA and so it won't have all the instructions set and constructs that are available otherwise. Um, you don't have kind of unlimited memory, so you normally have a bit of memory attached to the GPU that you're staging data back and forth with. Um, and I believe the cores themselves aren't super fast, and so you know they have to be able to do a serious chunk of data before they go and communicate and aggregate their kind of results. Um, but things, I think the most typical one that's being used is, is dense linear algebra, which means basically deep learning. We just take one big matrix that has a bazillion rows, another big matrix, multiply those things together, it's just a bunch of array operations, for loops, and that works very, very well. And that's probably the vast majority of stuff. When you actually get down to the guts of it, that it's actually being done, you know, multiplying matrices together. And that works very, very well in GPUs. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And one more round of applause for Dave. <laughs> and we'll start the next talk in about eight minutes. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.